Amen. Praise God. At the very beginning of this year, back, uh, actually started in December, um, God began to just uh, deal with my heart. I, I, I was spending time in prayer and just, I do that every year. Lord, what is, what is your, what's the trajectory for 2017? Where do you want us to go? Where do you, where do you want us, big picture, as, as, a, as a family, where do you want to lead us? Uh, and uh, God began to impress some things uh, onto my heart, and I shared uh, the, the whole first month, the whole month of January, what I was sensing God was wanting to take us into. David said in Psalm 147, uh, verse 19, he has revealed his words to Jacob, his decrees and regulations to Israel. He has not done this for any other nation. They do not know his words. And the reality was no other God in all of David's time, and there are many gods, and there are millions of gods today, but no other God revealed his will and his plan and his heart and his way and his direction to his people. Only Yahweh did that for the people of Israel. And, and God's word has always been a gift to us. Amen? Uh, it, it's, been, it's been that revelation that we open up and it's there that we learn and we're fed and we grow and, and, and we begin to live by the ways of God. And it happens because He's given us His Word. And we saw uh, back in January that uh, at the very beginning of the year that this isn't just about me, just isn't about us alone, but that we're responsible to take what God has given us and the things that He teaches us and teach them to the next generation Teach them to our children. Moses said, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, and then you shall teach them to, to your children in Deuteronomy 6. Um, Timothy, um, a, a disciple of uh, the Apostle Paul, a young pastor, was mentored by him, and he grew up that way. And Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. And that's just the way that we, that we grow in the, in the ways of God. And, but back then, back in January, we also, we also saw that there's, there's another thing going on. There's another dynamic going on in, in, in the Christian culture I'm talking about, in the church. Um, we saw that we live in a culture where... Uh, only one half of 1% of young people between the age of 18 and 23 have any kind of biblical worldview at all, who live their lives according to the principles of the Scripture. Only one half of 1% of that younger generation. Uh, we saw that uh, even among adult, uh, older experienced, born-again believers, people who say, yes, I'm saved, yes, I'm going to heaven, yes, I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when they were asked in a Barna study, when they were asked, well, who was the first person to say, you must be born again? The number one answer to that question was Billy Graham. In fact, Jesus was number three. Jesus was number three among Christians. Born again, it was in that same study shown to us that uh, only one out of every five born again believers in America actually live their lives and understand the world, understand what's going on around them uh, based on the revelation and principles of the Word of God, that we are suffering from incredible biblical uh, illiteracy. In our, in our world today. And, and, and I looked at those things, and, and you, I shared the process with you uh, in January. You can go back and listen to those messages if you want to. They're online. And, and, but with those admonishments from Scripture and the times that we lived in and what, what I saw happening, I felt, I felt very strongly in my heart that what we needed to do this year, that 2017 needed to be the year that we take back our Bibles that we make an intentional commitment. Say, God, uh, I'm not just going to let this thing collect dust on top of my TV set anymore. We're going to get into the Word of God, and we're going to begin to grow 
in the ways of God and, and read and learn and grow in, in the scriptures. And we've done a lot of things this year in a lot of, from a lot of different directions in, in obeying that, that uh, mandate that the Lord has given us. And uh, um, I, I can't wait for this walk through the Bible uh, event in October. That is just, that's going to be just a blast. And you want to be here. Bring your friends. Listen, if money's the problem, I can't, I don't have $10, which I just think about how many coffees you have between now and October. You could probably save $10. I think you could. But if for some reason you just don't have $10, well, we can help you. But, but uh, I challenge you to pre prepare now. We're telling you now so that you can afford the book and the guide and everything so that you'll have all the tools that you need to really enjoy this experience. Uh, I, you just don't want to miss it. But I was praying about um, this morning and I was praying about this fall and praying about some of the other things that we want to do with this, with the rest of this year in terms of taking back our Bibles. And, and uh, as I was praying and, and uh, reading the scriptures, something caught my eye. And it didn't just catch my eye, it grabbed my spirit. Just, have you ever been grabbed by God? Just, God just grabs a hold of your heart. Well, that, that's kind of what happened here. Uh, as I was reading in the book of Revelation, um, and, I, and I take it as a kind of a next level for us when we think about taking back our Bibles. What, what does that mean and what's the next level? What is God saying to us? And in Revelation chapter 10, there's something that I believe God wants us to see as we're on this journey of intentionally taking back our Bibles and, and uh, asking God to shape our lives with His Word. In Revelation 10 and verse 9, John is speaking and he says, I went to the angel telling him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And verse 10, I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it. And in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach, my stomach was made bitter. And then I read that experience that John had. And the Holy Spirit just dropped into my heart. This is the next step in taking back our Bibles in those three words. Eat this book. Eat this book. Now, what in the world does that mean? <laughs> Eat this book. The context of what happened to John here is, is, is uh, just amazing. Remember, John is an apostle. John is a prophet. John is a pastor. Um, he is on the island of Patmos. He's, a he's in prison for his, his faith and being a leader of this, this cult, this Jesus cult. And, but while he's there, he's still writing and he's still praying and he's trying to lead and trying to pastor and give guidance and hope and leadership to a people uh, in really in seven churches there in, in what's now Turkey uh, who were socially and economically and politically uh, just powerless in, the, in their society. They were completely mar marginalized people. They, uh, they were just being a Christian in John's day. At the very least, by the time this is written, the book of Revelation, by the time it's written, being a Christian at least cost you your job. That was the least. It cost you your job. If they found out you were a Christian, you didn't work for them anymore, you, unless you were a slave. But it could, also mean, uh, it could also mean imprisonment, and it could also mean death. The church was being persecuted, and it was a very dark time in, in, in the history of the early church. And John was writing, and John was praying, and John was prophesying over these churches that he loved so much, um, and he was calling them to, to step out. He was reminding them, don't, don't just survive. Live, live for Jesus no matter what it costs. Let your first love be that driving force in your life. Don't let that slip. Don't let that go away. And he's 
telling the churches this because every letter, every letter that he wrote always went around to these churches and they read about their first love and, and uh, here, are, here are people that John saw. John saw as light. These are people who were light in a very dark world. And so he describes the churches as seven lampstands, seven churches, seven lights in a dark world. And he says, don't lose your first love, keep after it. And as he's writing these things to the churches, and as he's uh, receiving from the Lord the, the revelation of Jesus, <laughs> in chapter 10, John sees this gigantic angel. I mean, we're talking about a colossus, uh, an angel so big he has one foot in the Mediterranean Sea and another foot on, uh, on, on the land. And he's standing there and, and the angel is preaching. And the Bible says that his, his voice is like the sound of thunder. The, and he's preaching from a little book. He has a book in his hand and he is preaching. And John sees him and he's enormous. And what happens is, is uh, I mean, nobody's sleeping. His, uh, like, like you guys do during this time of day. Uh, nobody's sleeping. Uh, the, uh, the Bible says that, that John started to write down what the angel was preaching. He sat down and he began to write, and the angel said, Stop! Don't write what I'm saying. Don't, don't write it down. And what John does next, and it's where our text comes in, what, what John does when the angel tells him not to write, not to take notes on this sermon, is, is, is just the epitome of a, of a, of a man or a woman, a, a person, a pastor, who is just hungry for God, hungry for a word from God, because this is what John does. John, it's, John says, I went up to the angel. <laughs> are, you, are you kidding me? <laughs> This thing is, this, this, this being is enormous. And he says, I, I went up to the angel and I said, give me that little book. And the angel went, you know, <laughs> I mean, there, there had to be some fear there, but there was such a hunger in John's heart for, for what this angel was preaching. And he asked for the book. And the angel said, yes. Put down your notebook. Put down your pencil and your paper. And I'm going to give you this book, but here's what I want you to do. Eat this book. Eat this book. That's the context of our text. And the angel said, it'll be honey to your lips, but get ready. Because once you finish chewing it up and swallowing it, you're probably going to have a belly ache. It's probably going to mess with your stomach. Now the word that is used in Revelation here for book, some of your translations say scroll, is, uh, is the Greek word biblion. It's where we get our word Bible. The angel says to John, eat this Bible. Eat this Bible. Don't just read it. Don't just take notes about what people say about it or from it. But eat it. What does that mean? What's the value behind that? Why, why is the angel saying that? And it's this, beloved. It, it's, this is so important that we understand none of us, we don't just stumble into knowing God. Amen? We don't just stumble into knowing and loving and serving and obeying and hungering and thirsting after God. That doesn't happen by accident. We're not just walking along one day and suddenly we know God. It doesn't happen that way. This, this book, 
this, this word, it, it, it reveals the person who created the heavens and the earth. It, it reveals his heart. It reveals his, his priorities. It reveals his ways. It, reve it reveals his acts. It reveals who he is. It speaks to us of the word when the word became flesh and dwelled among us and lived among us and ministered among us and died for us and rose again for us so that we could have life. Tells us about that. That's what this book does for us. It, it, it reveals God's heart and it reveals God's, God's way, His love, His grace. The Holy Spirit comes along and takes the, the, the words of this book and illuminates them in our lives. Hallelujah. Turns them on like, like, a, like an LED light that suddenly has received a zap of electricity and the light goes on. The Holy Spirit works with this, this word and illuminates it inside of us and something inside of us begins to change. Faith is born and righteousness and hope and truth and power and love and grace and, and, and gifts and all of these things begin to happen because the Holy Spirit is working through His Word and God is changing our life. How many are hearing what I'm saying this morning? That's the, that's the impetus behind the angel saying, you've got to eat this thing. Eat this book. <laughs> I, I, love, I love teaching. You probably noticed that. <laughs> I, I love teaching. And I love teaching college students. I, I love, in fact, I got to teach a, a bunch yesterday up in St. Cloud. Uh, I, I just, uh, but one of the questions that I get asked um, quite often as a, as a teacher is um, uh, when I'm giving them an assignment and giving them some pages to read out of their textbook, what's the question that you ask the teacher? Come on, you students. Is this gonna, huh? Is it gonna be on the test? Is this gonna be on the test? How many have ever asked that question? Everybody in this room who's been to school has asked that question at least once. Is this gonna be on the test? Because there's this, there's this thing in all of us that uh, well, do I need to know this? I mean, look at this thing. There's a lot of stuff in here. What's going to be on the test? <laughs> what, what do I need to know to, to go to heaven? What, what do I need to know to have a better life? See, with, with students, they ask that question because if it's not going to be on the test, then why should I read it? If it's not going to be tested... Well, yeah, the professor wants me to know it, but I'm not going to be tested, so I won't read it. Uh, I confess I've done that a few hundred times in my life. <laughs> but uh, too often we, we, we come to the Bible with that same attitude, with that same kind of spirit, and we, we kind of say, well, well what, what's going to be on the test? There's, there's so much here. Um, what what's the basic that I need to know so that I can go to heaven or so that I can have a better life or so that I could be a better dad or a better mom? What, what, just what's the stuff that, that uh, I need to know? What, what's going to be on the test? And we kind of come to the Word of God that way. And the Holy Spirit is here this morning to help us to see something about the Word of God that, that we seldom see as Christians, and the statistics bear it out that we don't see it. The angel didn't say to John, read this book because there's some good information in there that you should know. He didn't say, here, John, I want you to memorize these portions of this book because it'll give you a better life. It'll make you happier. It'll increase your faith. It'll, it'll show you how to get God to do things that, that you want him to do. 
The angel didn't say that. In fact, I liken that to the honey part of the, of the, of the imagery here. Because God's word is sweet. It is sweet. Amen? And David said that in Psalm 119, verse 103, he says, How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. There's a whole bunch in this book that's just, mmm, it's sweet like honey. Amen? But there's some stuff in this book that'll give you a stomachache. There's some stuff in this book that as much as we like to eat honey, sometimes we have to eat our broccoli. And that's in here. And it might taste, it might not taste that sweet. What happens? And it's because the angel, angel doesn't say taste this book. He says eat this book. That's huge. He doesn't say taste this book. I think, I think you know, we get in trouble if we're just a Bible taster. Um, we need to be Bible devourers. And God's calling us to that. What happens when you eat something? I mean, really eat something in, in, in physically. I mean, it becomes energy. It becomes strength. It flows into the synapses of your brain and your nerves and it, it, it builds your muscles and it, it nourishes your body and it sustains your life and it m makes you a force to be reckoned with on the job. Right, Mark? You eat and man, you get in there and you're ready to go. It, it just makes you, it, it, it strengthens you. That's what, that's what eating does. That's why we, we, we want to have good nourishment, physically speaking. And God... God is calling us to eat this book. And it's not the first time that he does it. He, he, he does it uh, to Ezekiel, another prophet who's hungry for God and trying to, to discern what the Lord is doing. In Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 8, he says, Now you, son of man, listen to what I am speaking to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I'm giving you. And then I looked, and behold, a hand was extended to me, and lo, a scroll, or a book, was in it. And when he spread it out, in front, he unrolled the scroll, when he spread it out before me, it was written on the front and on the back, and on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. And then he said unto me, Son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll, and go speak to the house of Israel. And so I opened my mouth, and he fed me this scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll which I am giving to you. And then I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. Even though what I had to say to Israel was broccoli and Brussels sprouts, lamentations and woe. Jeremiah 15, your words were found and I ate them and your words became for me a joy and a delight of my heart for I have been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. And not just the Old Testament, but Peter uses nourishment words uh, too when he talks about the scriptures. 1 Peter 2, he says this, like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. And, and you moms know, sometimes if a baby doesn't quite drink their milk very good, sometimes you put a little bit of honey with that milk. You put something sweet with that milk so that that baby will drink that milk. It's what you do to get them started. But then he goes on. And, and, and we need to do that. We need to be feeding our children, and we work really hard around here to feed our children the milk of the Word. That's a high, high value at Riverside Church. And our, not just, not just 
uh, children, children, but new, new believers. That's what all these ministries that got announced this morning, that's what it's all about, is, is, is feeding, and our new believers need, need milk too. But they don't stop there. Peter goes on, and he talks about growing into the solid food of God's Word. The writer of the Hebrews in, in Hebrews 5 says, For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. But solid food is for those who are mature. And God wants all of us to be on solid food. And so the angel says to John, Eat this book. Eat this book. Take it into every tissue of your life. It's, it's always going to be sweet to your lips. It is. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's going to be sweet to your lips, but don't stop there. Because that's not where the Word of God does its most powerful work. It's not in your lips. It's not in the tasting. It's when we swallow it. It's when we eat it up. Jesus said it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. And it's getting that word of God abundantly in our heart. And, and the New Testament is all full of this language. It's taking this book into your mind, into your heart, into your attitudes, into your thoughts, into your vision, into your imaginations, into your dreams and ideas, into your hearing and into your hands and into your feet and into your relationships, into the way you work and the way you live your life, the way you love your family, the way you raise your kids. Eat this book. And there's going to be times when it's going to give you heartburn. But I'd rather have heartburn from God <laughs> than heartburn because I didn't listen to God. Because that's an eternal heartburn that I don't want. And what I mean by that is, it, it, you know, when God's dealing with you about something, it might keep you up at night or two might not be the easiest thing for you to think about and deal with in your life. Anytime light confronts darkness, anytime truth confronts a lie, anytime spirit confronts flesh, we get uncomfortable, we get a bellyache, but it's healthy. It's healthy because it brings change. Amen? It brings change. It brings transformation, and that's what God's Word does deep inside of us, not just our lips, but every fiber of our being because our eternal life depends on it. Hallelujah. Will you turn to the person next to you and say, you know what? When it comes to God's Word, I don't want to be a lips-only Christian. I don't want to be a lips-only Christian. I think that's what the Bible means when it says, you know, they praise me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They didn't eat the book. Didn't eat the book. Well, I thought a long time about how I wanted to end this message because I, I'm talking to all of us, pastor too. Pastor, have you eaten this whole book? Well, I've read it. I've read it, and I've studied it, and I've dug into it, but have I eaten it all? Nope. Nope, because I still, there's still things in me that don't look like things in here. So I think we're all in that same boat, right? Anybody in here perfect already? If you are, come on up, and we'll turn this thing over. Okay, Freddie, come on up. You, come on up. <laughs> we're all still eating the book, but we want to eat it together. And so um, we're going to do some things this year, the rest of this year, to help us learn how to eat the book. And I just, I just have a gift for you. Um, I want, can I get some help? And can we, I just have a 
little book that I want to give you to help you start eating the book. It's just called How to Study the Bible, and maybe you've never gone there before. Just give them out until they're gone. Let's start with like one per unit, whatever a unit looks like. When we were missionaries, we were called units. <laughs> and we've got some, some uh, Middle Easterners here, some Palestinians to help uh, pass them out. That's good. Uh, but if you need more, some, some of you need two. Some of you, uh, if, if you're like, you know, my wifey reads at one time and I read it another time, so go ahead and take two so you each have one. If we, as long as we have enough, I want to give them away. I don't want any left over. But I want you to take it and I want you to just begin to use it to learn how to eat this book. Because I believe in this. I, I want us to do this word, not just, not just agree with this word. Amen? Is there any left? Did everybody get one? Do we have at least? Here's an extra one. Okay. Make sure that at least there's one per unit, one for a couple or family, and then, and then we can do more as we have them. And I'll order some more because I want you to, I want you to, but you got to promise me you'll use it. Don't just put it on the TV with your Bible. <laughs> okay. You got to use it. And then, and then on Wednesday nights, Wednesday nights, I'm going to help you, and we're going to get into this more, and we're going to learn how to eat this book, because this is important stuff for us as a people, for us as a family. Amen? Let's pray together. Jesus, we receive this as, as a word from God that gives us the next step that we are to take as the family of God in taking back our Bibles. It's more than simply agreeing to read through the Bible in a year and get bored with numbers and chronicles and give up. We're here, Lord God, to stand before you and present ourselves and ask you to help us obey what you have spoken to prophets many times to eat this book until it changes who we are, till we look like what it says we are, until we know you like it says you are, until we do what it says we can do, until we live the way it calls us to live. Help us, Lord, as a body, as a church, to take this seriously and begin to move forward wherever we're at. Some in this room have been walking this way for years. Some are brand new. But God, we all need to move forward, every one of us, to eat this book. And I pray for blessing. I pray for, God, I pray for just... Uh, uh, words and revelation to just jump off the pages as, as we begin to uh, obey, uh, obey this word and truly do it. God, reward even the tiniest effort with revelation and grace and direction and understanding so that we can be the people that you've called us to be. And we can navigate the times that are upon us. There is no question that you are using the disasters that are happening around the globe to wake up humanity, to call people to repentance, to call people to know that their time is short. And so, holy God, help us to be a people who understand the times and know what to do because we are people who've eaten the book. And we thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. hallelujah. I'm gonna ask our ushers to come one more time. We've got a few more books left. If you'd like a book, uh, raise your hand. We've got a few left. Here's, here's one. Okay, well, I'd like for everyone here to have them first before we go giving them to the jail and everybody. Let's.
make sure that everybody here gets one because I want this church to be equipped. If you need one, raise your hand. And then I'm going to ask our ushers to come. A hundred percent of this offering will go to victims at, uh, uh, of Harvey and Irma. And if you're writing a check, just write it to Riverside Church, but put Harvey in the memo, and we'll put all those funds together and get one uh, made out, and we're going to send it with Larry. And, and uh, uh, I'm not sure what we're gonna, how we're going to do it, but we'll get that figured out before... Uh, before Tuesday, and uh, we'll do that. Amen? Let's give generously. And by the way, thank you guys, everybody who has already brought things into the gym, uh, thank you. Um, and um, there's room for more. Uh, bring stuff by this afternoon if you'd like to. Jesus, we pray again for our brothers and sisters, especially in, in these places that are being hit, but we pray for all of the folks, Lord God, in the islands as well as Florida and other states. Pray for protection. We pray that there would be somehow miraculously minimal damage, minimal effect. We pray for testimonies of lives miraculously saved, that that the trajectory of of uh, of the hurricane miraculously turned away from population centers away from hospitals, away from schools, away from places where people are gathered. God, just, Lord, would you just show your hand in this? I just think of the scripture that where the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord raises up a standard against it. Lord, God, raise up a standard against this thing and protect people, Lord, because you love us all. And God, take this, these gifts, this offering, oh Lord, and use it to alleviate some pain wherever, wherever it can be used. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God. All right. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every heart, every home that's represented in this room. I pray that you would cover every family, every household with the blood of Jesus. I pray, O God, that your spirit would visit those who are sick among us, people who can't be here because of illness, people who struggle even in this room, O Lord, as we worship and give our hearts and lives In service to you, O Lord, would you reach down and touch people and give strength and blessing. Those who are struggling and need your provision, do financial miracles. Do miracles, Lord God, of uh, relational healing, emotional healing, spiritual strength. God, continue to visit us as we walk our way. And Lord, use us as a light. Wherever we go this, this week, Lord, whether it's school and back to class or at work or at home, wherever it is, use us as a light for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
God bless you. I love you guys. You have a great week.